Hi, I'm Dr. Philip McMillan, and thank you again for joining me today as I continue to analyze the science around COVID-19 by asking sometimes difficult, inconvenient questions, but important scientific analysis. So, my question is in relation to the vaccinated who die, how and should this happen on the first exposure to COVID-19? Now, the context of this is that as I've been researching COVID-19, there are specific patterns that occur in severe disease early in the pandemic in the unvaccinated that we need to understand whether or not that pattern exists in the vaccinated. It's very important because our treatment modalities may be different. At the end of the day, everything is about understanding disease and saving lives. So at the start of the vaccination program, because I'd done the research, there were a few questions that stood out to me, especially in the context of Australia and New Zealand. Now, I recently did a presentation on the fact that in Australia, the Senate voted against investigating in excess deaths. And genuinely, I was upset. And the reason I was upset was not just about the politics, but because of the fact that very important scientific data would be lost. We wouldn't have an understanding as to what exactly is happening in the context of exposure to COVID-19 in the vaccinated cohort. So this is why I'm asking this scientific question. And you have to remember that it comes from a question that I asked in September 2021. Possible outcomes for the COVID-19 vaccine campaign in Australia. And at that point, I was already identifying whether or not if by vaccinating the whole population, we would be priming them for an autoimmune response on re-exposure. Now, why would I be thinking about that? Is it quite random that I'm thinking about some kind of concern on re-exposure? Well, it's simply because, just as a reminder, just in case you haven't thought about it, the question you should have asked is, why don't we have a vaccine for SARS-CoV? This is the virus that infected China and Asia in 2003. And it wasn't because they weren't trying. It was because there were some very specific problems that they had with developing a vaccine. And in this post here that I have done, this was done some time ago. This was probably in October 2022. I did the analysis as to what was happening there and the fact that they had used a number of different vaccine candidates for SARS-CoV. And the problem that they had when they were doing that, certainly in the animal models, they hit a problem with regards to the vaccine. Now, I'm going to show you what they said in conclusion from that paper. But before I explain it, I'll tell you a very important thing that they did in the science, and that's a challenge study. So what they did with the animals, at that, that time there were ferrets and mice, they vaccinated them and then they challenged them. So they waited until the vaccine had its full response, the antibody response, and they found that all the vaccine candidates worked protein-based, vector-based, and all of them worked to produce an immune response. The question that they had scientifically is, okay, now that we've got an immune response from the vaccine, what happens when we challenge the animals by exposing them to the virus? And challenge studies are very, very important. Here is a basis of a, of a paper talking about the design and recruitment of, for challenge studies and how important it is to understand. So challenge studies continue to provide a valuable role in the assessment of protective immunity. And they've been doing challenge studies since the 18th century. 
And so in that context, a challenge study is a critical part of understanding just how effective your vaccine is, because you need to know what happens on re-exposure. Well, what then happened when they did the animal models was that they found this situation. On exposure of the animals to all of the vaccines that they tested with SARS-CoV, it did induce antibody protection against the um, virus. However, what they found was that there was a T helper 2 type immune pathology suggesting a hypersensitivity to the components. And this was with all the vaccines. And they said caution in proceeding to application in humans. But this was for SARS-CoV. Now, I've mentioned this before, but this is a critical piece of research. Now, the reason this is relevant in the context of Australia and New Zealand is because these countries closed down zero COVID at the early part of the pandemic. And so I'm going to highlight what exactly happened, certainly within the context of uh, New Zealand. And you have here, this is the data from New Zealand, COVID-19 vaccine data, data and statistics about the rollout of COVID-19 vaccines in New Zealand. And what they did was that this is the vaccine uptake percentage by band, age ranging from age 90 all the way down to 5 to 11. And you can see that 90% of the over, well, probably 95% of all the over 60s and about 90% of the whole population. And when you look at districts of residence, age 12 plus, the 90% mark, they largely achieved almost a 90% penetration of vaccination in their communities. So that was an exceptional public health effort that they managed to do this. The question then becomes, now when they release the virus or when they release the restrictions, what then happens? And that's a scientific question. It's not just about politics. That's what we need to understand. We need to understand exactly what then happens when the virus then comes in. So I'll take you now to a bit of statistics with regards to what happened exactly in New Zealand. So remember, they had zero COVID, 90% of the population vaccinated. What were the outcomes? So I'll take you here to the WHO statistics. And so this is a global statistics, and you can see here all the way from 2020, almost zero infections all the way through, all the way up to here. This is a starting point, February 2022, 90% vaccination. You can see then that infections start to rise. So that in itself gives us an idea that the vaccine doesn't protect fully against transmission because people are still getting infected. When we look at deaths, we can see as well that deaths start to rise almost immediately. And you can see it flattens a bit in the summer and then has continued to rise into 2023. And so that's very important data because it helps us to understand a little bit more about the virus. And you have to remember that this data is with Omicron. So this was not with Delta or Wuhan or the original variant. This is with Omicron, which we know is a milder form in terms of pro producing severe COVID-19. So my question is, for those people who died in New Zealand, what was the mechanism of death? Was it the same cytokine storm that you saw in the unvaccinated? Was it different? Was it immune pathology in the lungs, like what happened with prior SARS-CoV vaccines, as we saw in the animal models? These are the kinds of scientific questions that we need to answer. And sadly, the decision that was made in Australia to not investigate excess deaths means that we cannot understand the pathology. Listen. We need politicians to realize this is not just about winning elections, and this is not just about now. The virus is still circulating in highly vaccinated regions. What is the pathology? What exactly happens in the lungs? 
How is it that people die? Now, just in case, and I'll show you, bring back here the uh, image. Some people may say that without the vaccination, this would have been much worse. That's possibly true because we know vaccination does have an impact on severe COVID-19. What we don't know is whether or not it has an impact on excess mortality. However, just for context, if we look at another country, Papua New Guinea, that is in the vicinity, not too far from New Zealand, much poorer, has a certainly different demographic. When you look at their numbers, and if you put it onto the, the cumulative, in Papua New Guinea, the total deaths was 670 out of a population of 8 million. So they have a bigger population than New Zealand, much lower case rate, much lower deaths. The interesting thing about Papua New Guinea is that it's only 4% vaccinated. So that's a little bit of a problem when we start to assume that our intervention necessarily made a huge difference. This is why the science is so important. And I take you back to what has happened in Australia and it's relevant to New Zealand. These are the only countries at the moment in the world where we had such good zero COVID, I mean, good in the sense that they were so effective at it, that we actually have proper challenge studies. That means we can then look at the pathology around the disease to better understand it and hopefully save lives. Remember the numbers. The numbers are at the moment there were 2,700, 2,893 deaths of COVID-19 in primarily, I guess, the vaccinated cohort. Without autopsies, we are blind. That's my question and my request to these countries. Please, let's put politics aside for a bit. Let's realize that it is still important to understand the pathology. Even if you believe the pandemic is over, there could still be another variant of SARS that turns up. The better we study, the better we prepare, the better chance we have to handle and prevent death. I'm sure that's what everybody wants. Have a great evening. I hope you found this valuable.